today, Abdullah. And uh, it is very hard for a student of knowledge like me to talk in the existence of true scholars like Dr. Robert Crane and the other respectable uh, scholars. I, I have no problem going and traveling the world with you just to carry your microphone, actually, or your <laughs> shoes even, if, if you need. I start by praising God, the creator and the sustainer of the universe. And I ask him to send his peace and blessings upon all the prophets of Islam, including Muhammad and Jesus, son of Mary, and Moses, and Abraham, and Noah. Muslims around the world are close to become 1.7 billion people. 85 to 90 percent of those are Sunni, while 10 to 15 percent of them are Shia. Let's zoom in on Sunni Muslims. Among Sunni Muslims, there are different ideologies. Regarding philosophy, there are two main camps. The first one is the camp of the Salafis, and the second one is the camp of the Ash'aris and Maturidis, and among them are the Sufis. The differences between them can be compared to an extent to the difference between Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians. Both believe in the same main tenets of Christianity or the Christian creed, but they differ on the nature of God. Well, both Muslim camps have the same main tenets of faith, same pillars of Islam, and they pray together in the same mosques, but they differ on very profound philosophical topics. And both of them, of course, claim orthodoxy for themselves. None of them claims uh, uh, Catholicism. That was a joke you can laugh at. <laughs> uh, but regarding activism, that was about the philosophy. Those are the camps. But regarding activism, there are also two main camps. The camp of the Muslim Brotherhood and the camp of the Salafis. Guess what? Among the Muslim Brotherhood members, there are <coughs> Salafis, in philosophy. And there are Ash'aris and Sufis and Maturidis among the members of the Muslim Brotherhood too in philosophy. And uh, when it comes to, uh, 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 this is of course when it comes to philosophy. Let's now focus on Salafism and leave the Muslim Brotherhood aside. So see, we are zooming in, zooming in until we zoom in on the Salafis alone. Let's now focus on Salafism, which is the point of discussion today. <coughs> Salafism is supposed to be a reform movement which aims to return Muslims to the traditions of the Salaf. Salaf literally means the ancestors or the predecessors. But idiomatically, Salaf means the first three generations in the history of Islam after the appearance of its final prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The generation of his companions or Sahaba in Arabic, and the generation of their students, namely at tabi'in which means the followers. And the third generation is the generation of the students, of the students, of the companions of Prophet Muhammad, in Arabic, tabi'i at tabi'in literally the followers of the followers of the companions of Prophet Muhammad. Those three generations are known for their piety and pure following of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Therefore, Salafism, is supposed to be a pure following of the path of Prophet Muhammad exclusively and meticulously while adhering to the example of the Salaf, the first three generations. At the same time, rejecting any other source of influence. But unfortunately, in many countries, Salafism turned into a hyper-literalist group which hijacked the term Salafism and used it to serve the agenda of tyrants and oppressors. And this in itself is an innovation in the religion of uh, Islam. Innovation is called bid'ah, which Salafism was supposed to be combating as a reform movement. Like Sufism was hijacked by modern day, some modern day Sufis, Salafism was also hijacked by many uh, modern day Salafis who do, both do not represent the pure ideology. None of neither the companions of Prophet Muhammad nor any of the next two generations that followed, that followed them 
could have used any unauthentic statement, knowing that it is unauthentic, and still attributed to Prophet Muhammad to silence the masses and make them accept oppression. Unfortunately, modern day Salafi scholars do so. And because of that, most Salafis are silent. They shun political activism and concentrate only on learning Islamic sciences. And it is very harmful when people learn something, but they practice the opposite of it. For example, among the very important tenets of Islam is enjoining what's good and forbidding what's deplorable, known in Arabic as al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar. And this applies on advising rulers and even trying to stop them from oppressing the masses. It is very harmful for the whole society uh, to have a large group of people learning something and practicing the opposite of it because this in itself creates a hypocritical group mindset. For example, a military coup, according to Islam, is an armed rebellion against the legitimate elected ruler. And those who participate in it are called khawarij, which means rebels. And this is studied by the Salafis. Yet, the hypocritical mindset justified for their leaders supporting a military coup, being a part of the conspiracy itself against a legitimate leader. Thanks God that the pure innate nature of many of their youths prevented them from falling into this major sin, and many of them opposed uh, the coup. The most hypocritical of all those groups is a group that is called the propagandists, or in Arabic called al jamiya who do not just support the oppressive regimes, but rather defend it and bestow their blessings on it and justify all its actions. They use what is known scholarly as wounding and setting right, which means in Arabic al-jarh wa ta'deel, to discredit any Islamic opposition to the rulers. And it is not surprising that they were the fiercest enemies of the Arab Spring, which aimed to peacefully change the oppressive regimes. They are leading the propaganda that the reason behind the chaos in the Middle East today is the Arab Spring. Though the Arab Spring, in the eyes of free people, is the best thing ever happened in the region since the death of Prophet Muhammad, since the coming of Prophet Muhammad. That's the second good thing that happened after the appearance of Prophet Muhammad in our region. The chaos is because of the conspiracy against the Arab Spring, not the Arab Spring itself. Of course, my words should not be generalized. There are definitely Salafis who are sincere and follow true Salafism, and therefore they did not shun political activism. Salafism in Saudi Arabia is also known as Wahhabism, named after Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, who died in the year 1792. Wahhabism is a reform movement within Islam, which cleared it from a lot of heretical innovations. But Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, as well as his successors, fell in two big mistakes. First, they used force and violence to spread their ideology, so they weakened it instead of strengthening it. Two, they were and are very intolerant to opinions which differ from theirs, even within the same Sunni school of thought, like the Muslim Brotherhood or the Sufis, uh, the Sufi sects, let alone the Shia sects, which is concentrated in the eastern part of the kingdom. We must know that since Saudi Arabia was founded as a kingdom in the 18th century, and the family of Al Saud have been always enjoying the legitimacy given to them by the Wahhabi clergy. In return, they were given the upper hand in anything regarding religion, teaching, or practicing in the country. So there was always a deal, unwritten, by, but known by everyone for us the politics and power, and for you the influence on the masses. Islam in the hands of most Saudi Wahhabi scholars is like the pizza dough in the hand of the Napoli 
uh, chefs uh, in Italy. They can Islamically forbid women from driving and then Islamically allow them to drive when the king and his crown prince want. They can Islamically forbid cinemas in the country and then Islamically allow them when the king and his crown prince want. They can Islamically forbid music concerts in the country and then Islamically allow them when the king and his crown prince want. They can Islamically forbid supporting Zionism in the country and then Islamically allow it as soon as the king and his crown prince want. They can Islamically forbid protests in the country and then Islamically, uh, Islamically keep them forbidden as long as the king and his crown prince want. Just like a dough, they can shape it and play with it uh, no matter how uh, uh, the king and his crown prince want. While followed and heard by the masses, intellectuals and educated people see them as sultan scholars. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the scholars of Islam have always been warning Muslims from listening to the scholars of the sultan, sultan scholars. On my way here, just before entering the tube, I was sent a crazy video that came from Saudi Arabia in which a Wahhabi scholar is sitting in a mosque speaking in a Dawra Shari'a, which means a Sharia workshop. Legislative workshop. What is he telling people on that video? He's saying, um, we worship God by showing obedience to Al Saud. Even if the ruler does some injustice to us, God will hold him accountable, not us. <laughs> this cannot be the religion of Umar ibn Khattab, the second caliph after Prophet Muhammad, whom, when he was talking to people, someone stood up and said, we will not listen or obey until you justify. How come you have fabric enough for your outfit, though you are much taller than us, and the fabric portion assigned to every one of us is limited and it cannot suffice you. So his son, Abdullah ibn Umar, stood up and said, I donated the portion of fabric, my portion of fabric to my father so that he can make his outfit. And then the guy said, or the, the companion said, now we sit and listen and obey. This cannot be the same religion. Historically, before the appearance of the partisan system in politics, the clergy in the Muslim world have always been playing the role of the opposition party which opposed anything that they saw wrong in politics or in society. And many of them, like the four founders, or three of the four founders of the schools of thought, were jailed and tortured. Today, in the 21st century, in Saudi Arabia, this is happening, but mostly not by Wahhabi clergy. Most of them have always, because most of them have always been serving the regime and showing their complete loyalty to it. I hope I have done justice to the topic within the limited time I have been given, and thank you very much for being a great audience.